Sheila is our presenter. Sheer, Sheila Marcinishin, she's an Ojibwe woman who's currently living in Thunder Bay, where she's supported Indigenous families for many years. Her work experience is very broad and includes youth and young adults with special needs, child development, maternal and reproductive health, parenting, nutrition, addictions, trauma-informed care and life skills, among others. There was a long bio uh, from, uh, from Sheila, so she's very experienced. But most of all, she's passionate about empowering and advocating for the well-being of Indigenous people, as well as supporting families to live a healthy, balanced life. And Sheila will start with a land acknowledgement. Sheila, would you like to bring your camera in to, uh, so that uh, everybody can, uh, camera. can oh, see okay. you? Yep. Okay, great. Thanks. And I'll just move. All right. Here she is. So thank you very much, Sheila. And I'll, uh, I'll uh, give you the, the microphone and you can do a land acknowledgement to start us off. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. Well, welcome everyone. And yes, I'd like to uh, acknowledge that we're on uh, the Fort William First Nations, uh, Robinson Superior area. So we like to, yes, acknowledge uh, the area that uh, that that where I'm I reside <laughs> here in uh, Thunder Bay. So uh, so just uh, okay. So just start now. <laughs> okay. So uh, yeah. So my name is Sheila Mars Mission, and um, uh, I just wanted to um, share a little bit uh, about me first um, before I go into the introduction of uh, agenda. Um, so I just wanted to um, share a little bit about the past uh, employment that I have uh, previously been been with. Uh, I, I've been with Anishinaabe and Meshkike for uh, 15 years um, and and part, supported uh, prenatal women and supported families uh, throughout the lifespan. And, uh, and then the past two years, I have, uh, I'm currently working with Nishnabi Asking Nation with the Family Wellbeing Program. And, uh, and I'd also like to uh, just uh, share a little bit um, uh, as well about, uh, about myself that I'm, uh, uh, yes, I'm Ojibwe. Uh, originally from Manitoba, belong to the Pegasus First Nations in, in Manitoba. And I, uh, that's where families come from, but we live in Thunder Bay now. And um, I have uh, I've been married, it'll be 25 years now, coming, uh, and I have three children, and uh, my oldest will be 23 this year, and I have a daughter, or my son has uh, just turned 19, and my daughter is 17, she'll be 18 in July, so she's in her last year of school, so, um, so yeah, so that keeps me, they keep me busy, and plus my previous uh, experience working with families. And um, um, if some of you are not sure about what the Family Wellbeing Program is, it's, it's a prevention-based uh, program uh, that with the Anishinaabe Asking Nation, and we have a sub-office in, um, in Timmins as well. So we support uh, families, uh, well, our coordinators that work in the community, we support them um, to deliver prevention-based programming on reducing family violence, reducing children going into care, and youth going into youth criminal justice system, and then overall health and well-being. And um, I just also um, wanted to mention a little bit about um, some of the work that. So when I worked at Mishkiki, I did a lot of advocacy work, working with families and um, you know during pregnancy and families involved in child welfare. So I did a lot of that and. Um, since I left uh, Mishkiki, I there's two families that I, I'm currently working with right now that's outside of my my job that I I've just gotten to know these two families uh, since since working at uh, at at Mishkiki there and um, and and I'll share a little bit throughout the presentation a little bit as well of, on some of the, the things that I'm um, that uh, come up in the slides that uh, pertain to some of the work that I've done or I'm doing as well. So the agenda, I just uh, yeah, introduce myself and uh, a lot of most of you have the, um, the, the PowerPoint. 
So I'm just going to just quickly do a quick overview of some of the historical impacts that have affected Indigenous women and some of the determinants of health, some of the risk factors to consider when working with Indigenous, indigenous women and understanding the needs of our women and looking at a harm reduction approach and trauma-informed approach as well and why Indigenous women do not access services and how to engage and empower women and then some of the wraparound uh, strategies that, that could possibly work for you, as well as some programming ideas that I have uh, done over the years. Um, that you, I just want to share some of the things that I've done that, that have been successful. And a uh, list of resources that, like Louise had said, is um, at, the, at, the, um, at the end of the presentation, uh, the PowerPoint, so, and then questions. So, um, so we're good, Louise. Should I continue? <laughs> okay. So, um, so I just want to talk a little bit about the historical impacts about like colonization. Um, so I know some of a lot of you probably already you know a lot know a lot of this already, but I just wanted to um, to just um, mention it because it does impact First Nations or Indigenous uh, people today. So, so colonization, you know, when first contact, you know, and then the, there was the fur trade, and and um, um, so we had all the um, all of that that has has happened and kind of changed things, and 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 um, being in crown lands and um, being part of the government um, uh, with the land, and um, just I just want to pull up my notes here. Sorry. Yeah, so you know, with the with the crown lands, you know, being on um, uh, part of you know federal and provincial governments, so crown lands are like you know um, national parks and Canadian forces and stuff like that. Whereas Canada or uh, for, sorry, reserves became that, and there's a lot of um, 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 research and uh, papers that are done about all that. And then um, um, so the reserves were like. Um, you know, a, a sense of segregation and assimilation, um, so that that uh, First Nations people were put in in reserves to um, to contain to contain them, and uh, and so in reserves, you know, you have limited um, limited resources, and uh, and then with the treaties, a lot of the treaties, you know, were were um, were created and and negotiated. Um, but a lot of, uh, there is some treaties that are, you know, uh, out in BC there, there's still, you know, places out of BC that haven't, don't even have treaties um, for, you know, sharing the land and, and, um, and there's that uh, um, Wet'suwet'uwin um, First Nations that uh, you see on the news there about, you know, the, the uh, pipeline and stuff. and. And that so um, yeah so and then there's just a lot of different um, uh, different uh, things that have impacted like you know with the treaties mean your um, sorry this kind of go to my notes here treaties yes um, were imposed to be created to use of the land and the resources right and uh, it was a way of creating that there thank you. <laughs> uh, and um, so also religious beliefs were forced upon the people. So uh, Christianity, um, like a lot of the Europeans came over and wanted to, uh, um, you know, I guess the way of, the way they saw the First Nations people living was, was, they, was uh, the wrong way, right? So they wanted to impose uh, their way. And so that was obviously, uh, you know, had uh, changed dramatically because we had uh, back then there was their own, we had the own way of, of life and living off the land in our own systems and um, yeah. And then the Crown Wars was, that, that's more about like the 60s group where the, um, um, you know, that the children that were taken and placed into foster care were uh, um, Crown Wards of the land, so uh, Crown Wards of the government. So, and the government responsibility to take care of them. So some other uh, cultural practices were illegal. So um, that um, a lot of times they, um, 
they couldn't practice the culture or they couldn't um, um, speak their language. And so there was a lot of racism and discrimination there. And it was, yeah, illegal to practice any um, cultural practices. So a lot of that went kind of um, underground a little bit. And then now over the years has come back um, you know, and then like being able to vote, like, you know, people were, you know, First Nations people weren't even able to vote and, or like once you left the reserve, you had to, um, you lost your status if you married somebody who was non-status and, um, and um, so, yeah, I'm part of that Bill C, <laughs> Bill C 63, uh, one, so, um, a racism, racism is another one. Um, um, and then the Indian Act of course defining on who we were, right, as people. And then the residential school where a lot of people um, were forced from their families and had to be placed into residential school uh, and never saw their families for for um, for years. And uh, and then um, you know some you know obviously the 62 for children were placed um, or taken and and out of their families and, and adopted into other other um, families, like whether it was within Canada or even, you know, United States or even overseas. So there was a lot of, yeah, children that were, um, um, that were in care as, uh, as well. So, and that have been disconnected, right, from their families. So there's a lot of big disconnect. And then with the residential school, like the loss of identity, and not being able to speak the language and um, and practice your culture that that really put a, a real strain on the families and and then because of the residential school you know the parents didn't have their children so they they lost that parenting uh, skill and um, and and their identity um, and then the um, trauma and abuse that had happened, right, in residential school. But not only residential school, but also like other traumas and abuse, like at residential school, I know you heard probably, um, you know, a lot of, of what happened and like a lot of the sexual and physical abuse. Um, there is a book at the end of the um, presentation that's um, the Indian horse. I don't know if some of you maybe have uh, have uh, seen that movie, but it's about a boy, young boy's uh, experience in residential school and how he um, turned to hockey to help him through his traumas that he's had, but um, and then help him through his healing journey. Um, so I I would recommend that for sure. And um, and then you have like the murdered, missing Indigenous women, right? A lot a lot of our Indigenous uh, women have been have gone missing and and um, there's, you know, the, yeah, so anyway, so the, I just don't want to get into much into that, but just that that has um, a big impact on families um, that don't have closure and, um, um, and and maybe, you know, as well as with the law, not, um, and, and the government not taking it seriously and, and wanting to uh, look into cases. Um, and, of course, affected by suicide, there's a lot of, um, communities that have um, been affected by by suicide um, a lot of young people uh, um, have, have, have committed suicide and I know in First Nations communities um, there is um, they call it the choose life program now that um, that is is happening in the communities and it, it's a real benefit to the First Nations communities because it addresses high risk um, uh, uh, children, well, youth, youth and young adults who are at risk of suicide. So there's been a lot of money put into um, into addressing that prevention part and, and supporting uh, young people who are um, um, who might be have uh, thoughts of, of suicide. And so um, I know just to quickly how that Choose Life program came about. There was a uh, that whole Wapakika, um, there was youth uh, that were were dying, and uh, they pleaded to the government to get. Uh, they wanted more funding to address it, and then they got denied. And, and then there was more suicides that happened. Then then it came to light, and and it was all. Um, and then these uh, bunch of uh, young people who were playing hockey came out on the ice and had this sign that said. Choose 
life. And so that's where that Choose Life program um, came from, unfortunately, from you know those tragedies. But um, but it's a really great program in, in the First Nation communities. Uh, I know the Nam Territory has a program that does the prevention and a lot of land-based. So it's, it's a great program. Um, so the determinants of health, um, I just want to um, um, touch a little bit on that um, because this definitely is something that affects that affects the, the women, the families that uh, you may be working with. So um, about the um, about the the physical environment. So so women that um, you know some of the physical environment is, is might not be the the greatest. And um, so you know you have that them living um, in in housing that I know in the First Nations community too there's you know lack of housing and and that's why a lot of families um, end up coming you know to the urban settings uh, areas of the um, because of the lack of, of housing and so if you don't have proper housing you know and you're you're going from from um, house to house like couch surfing um, it really makes that really difficult for, for People to uh, even want to, you know, go to programming and stuff, right? If if they're worrying about uh, their, their um, um, you know, where they live and, and a roof over their head. So um, yeah. So and then clean water as well, right? Like I know in a lot of First Nation communities, they there's still boil water, uh, boil water um, advisories, and it's. Uh, I know the the federal government is is. You know, uh, have a, um, announced that they're going to be putting more money towards that, so that's good. But but these are things that you know that that affect your health, right? And if you don't have clean, clean, safe drinking water, and you always have to bring in, you know, uh, um, water to um, to drink, um, and also about uh, you know with the oh my gosh, sorry, um, yeah, so so there's that physical environment, and then you know having to you know a safe place, right, that, that's, uh, to live. So some social support networks. Um, so that's having you know your family, your friends, um, and community, right? That's all all of that. Um, you know that if you have all these you know uh, support with family, friends, community, obviously you have a better health, right outcome. Um, but we also need to consider, though, that a lot of the women, I know this is, and I just I forgot to mention this in the beginning, that I'm just speaking from my experience, from the experience that I have working with uh, um, Indigenous women and families, um, and I'm, I'm no expert, and I, I can only just speak to, to my experience and uh, what I've seen and what, I, I, um, what has worked for me. So... In saying that, so, so social support networks. I know a lot of families like that I've worked with. They um, um, they lack that family support, so they might have you know fam. They might have um, parents that are still using, and and so when they're pregnant and they come to you, they reach out to you. Then you know that might be um, uh, one of her only. Is somebody that you um, are come in contact with, or if she comes to the program, or if she even comes to you know the clinic. Um, so, so a lot of families, yeah, they don't have that family support, and um, uh, especially the two families that I'm working with right now. But uh, um, it, it, they, the families are not in a well, in a, they're not well, and so. Um, I think that's kind of one of the reasons I've kind of drawn to these two families in particular because they lack that family support, and so I'm like a family to them. And so, um, and plus, I've developed a relationship with them over the years that that has contributed to this and how you know that why they're so open to me, open with me. Um, and also, we need to consider um, cultural customs too, right, and traditions, right, and the family. Uh, the family beliefs and uh, in the community. So we also we also need to 
um, be aware of that because everybody um, comes from different areas. Like, um, you know, I know the, the community is more in the, on the west uh, side of the province of Ontario here. It's quite different from the families on, on the Meshkeg West uh, Wabin area uh, by James Bay. So, so there is quite um, a difference in in that uh, in the cultural customs and, and traditions. So, just being aware of that um, as well. So, and education and literacy. So, a lot of times women um, they don't finish their education, and uh, whether it's due to the move because of um, you know getting their education. A lot of times, oh, most cases, a lot of communities. There's some communities that have high school, but they're very limited, and um, but a lot of times they have to come to in urban settings to get their education. So um, and and a lot of times these women um, they don't finish high school, and um, you know whether because they become pregnant or they have to move, the, um, and then they just when they try to finish their education they they just don't. Or there's different things that come up, right? Like there's um, different things that happen in their life that they um, that um, um, affect them. So. Um, and so low literacy, so when you're doing programming, I think I've mentioned throughout the slides, if you are doing um, education material, but try to make it at a grade six, like sixth level. Uh, and social environments. So social, um, yeah, it's all those, um, you know, I already mentioned that, um, is, you know, with their family and, and their community at large as well and where they come from. And, uh, and then employment and working conditions, right? So a lot of times the uh, First Nations people, um, there's not as many um, uh, lack of employment, I know, in the communities, in the, in the remote communities. And, um, and then also when they do uh, come to the urban settings, you know, there's, uh, maybe they don't, they don't um, have enough education to apply for jobs. So, so there's that as well. Um, income and social status um, as well, and I just want to go to the next slide because I'm personal health and practices and coping strategies. So, so with this, um, a lot of times, you know, there there may lack, um, you know, their proper nutrition, right? Or uh, sorry, proper uh, personal hygiene. And so, and then some of their coping um, coping skills is, um, you know, where they might not be able to cope with what's going on. So then they might lead to substance use. Um, they could, and um, so just those personal, just to remember that, like about the personal health, um, uh, that that they might, you know. Maybe they need a little bit more support in in that that area. So we just want to. Um, I'll get into more of the coping like skills and, and a little bit more of that. And then of course another determinant of health is healthy child development, right? So when you have um, um, you know the child, uh, a woman who's pregnant, and then say she has another child with her, she, so she's quite busy and she's got to worry about you know, the, her, her younger child and then also the, if she's pregnant as well, like there's a lot of times, you know, they have so much going on and, and they, they try to do the best that they can to help support the child. And, um, um, but, but again, with healthy child development, you know, you got to consider, you know, proper nutrition, right, as well. And if people are on limited income or on social assistance, they, they have a hard time making ends meet. So a lot of times they'll give to their child, and then they go. They the parents will go without. Um, and uh, especially when they're living in urban settings, the 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 cost is quite expensive. And um, and then a lot of times too, women um, they're supporting not only their fat like their children, but a lot of times their partner as well. Um, whoever they're with um, might not have an income, so. So, like, she has to support them as well. So, um, so and then any kind of um, uh, influences from their partner, right? Um, so, say if the partner is into gambling or something and wants wants her money, right? So that takes that money away from 
from maybe um, providing for her child. So, so there's different situations, which I'll get into, that we need to consider, um, as well as biological and behavioral, right? So we've got to consider all that, like what's, um, um, what is, um, um, sorry, I should be, keep hearing these sounds on my phone. <laughs> um, so biological, yeah, and behavioral, right? So the way we behave, um, so we need to consider, um, those aspects as well, and, and I know with biological, like that, um, there could, you know, uh, diabetes, right, is an example, right? So it's something that's hereditary that um, that gets passed down from from uh, family to family or generation to generation, and so um, so that's a consideration as well. And um, health services, I know a lot of times health services in the community, like they're they're limited. Right? They don't uh, have the services they have in the in First Nation communities as they do in urban settings. Um, but just to health, access to health services is, um, is something that we, uh, you know, need to consider as well, uh, as well as gender and uh, culture. Um, so I'm just going to continue to um, I want to make sure I have enough time here. Um, so risk factors to consider. So when you're working with Indigenous women, um, so some of these so poverty, like I mentioned just a, a little bit there, that poverty is um, a lot of times if the families are um, just, sorry, just hang on one sec. Sorry, I had to shut my door. <laughs> I'm at home here, so <laughs> I, I hear some noise out there. So sorry about that. Um, okay, so yeah, so risk factors to consider, so poverty. So we need to consider that um, women, you know, have limited income, and uh, you know, like they might not, they won't have extra money, you know, to do anything once they finish paying their rent, um, uh, food, right? Rent and food and and hydro and all that stuff and transportation. A lot of times, First Nations women, uh, women they they don't have access to a vehicle, so um, uh, so they. So there's all that, right, to consider. Um, and so inadequate housing and, and homelessness, so we need to consider that as well. Um, if they, a lot of times if they are moving from community to, from their community to an urban setting, they, they uh, have to find housing, right? So, and then a lot of times the areas that they live in are not the greatest either. And um, because a lot of, well, I know I can only speak about Thunder Bay that there's a lot of areas in the city that are not safe where there is a lot of um, like drug use and um, um, you have these gangs and that come in from out of town and they take over people's houses and they start selling drugs out of them and it's just it's just a real real. Um, unfortunate um, situations that, that some families get involved with. Um, and, um, and I know it's, it's happening here. And I know that uh, like uh, last week or the week before, there was uh, uh, um, a bus that they broke in and they um, were able to uh, get, get those, uh, those people out of there because like, they, they hold you hostage. And, and I know it affects uh, a lot of families here in, in, in the city, in Thunder Bay. And homelessness, right? So uh, maybe they don't have a place to stay. Um, one thing I wanted to mention about poverty is um, I know in the First Nations communities, there's just the cost of food is really, really expensive. So, um, so that is um, is something to consider as well. Like, uh, so maybe if maybe your program can help, you know, support the family in in food you know, providing food or kind of um, extra things that they might need um, because the, the cost, yeah, just even, you know, milk is like $12, a bag of milk or more even, $20 in some communities. And so that that is a lot uh, to take or to buy out of your money. And trauma, right? So we have a lot of trauma um, that people have overcome or that have experienced, like so, 
with the residential school, you know, with the 60 scoop, all those things, all those traumas that have affected people um, has is something that y you need to consider um, when you're talking with, um, with women. When you first talk to women, you know, it's just, you know, hi, how are you kind of thing, and, and so are you from, you know, kind of thing. You're kind of getting some conversations going, and then it takes time. One, over time, once you once you keep meeting these women, then you're able to um, get to know them a little bit more, and then they'll start sharing more with you. Uh, yeah, they you know some women who knows they they might share right away, but I know a lot of times in my my experience, they it usually takes you know a few a while, right? I just to say a while, <laughs> more than two or three visits, that's for sure. So um, and. So a lot of those traumas are, affect families, intergenerational trauma. Some of you have uh, probably heard that. So we need to consider those as well and, and um, uh, that those are things that can impact uh, women that you're working with. And so, you know, maybe she has um, been sexually abused or uh, maybe she's part of the child welfare system and, and she was when she was growing up. and. And you know now she, it's her first child, and she's pregnant, and she's trying to prevent, you know, if that from happening again. But um, but we need to consider about the traumas, right? That um, that our um, women are going through. So um, yeah, so we have the domestic violence. So domestic violence is another thing that um, um, women can experience, and women and girls are way higher. Um, higher rates of experiencing violence than non-Indigenous women. So, and I know a lot of this um, too, like is learned behavior, right? Like, so that sometimes they're in situations where they have grown up and they've been in in a, in a violent situation uh, that uh, maybe they've seen it from their parents. And then they just think that's normal, and they so when they find a partner, and he starts to treat her, you know, not very nice, and starts to hurt her, then she might think that that's just normal. Um, so those are things too that just to consider that um, the both the domestic violence part that that uh, that either been witnessed or they've experienced it themselves. So that's the physical, emotional, sexual, you know, domestic. Uh, Violence and then addictions. So I know from my experience that uh, women who um, who used to use they once they become pregnant, that's that's like a turnaround time for them where they realize like you know I I I don't I want a better life for my child. So so once you start engaging with them. Um, then, then they, you can address um, some of that, and um, and then she's ready for change. She's ready to make some changes. So, so it could be a lot of past, you know, past addictions, and a lot of times, you know, from the traumas that lead to addiction, or or addiction that they've seen this. This is something they grew up with, and that it's just normal to drink or do drugs. Um, that's all, you know, that's something that they've. Um, been exposed to and think it's normal, but when when they're pregnant, then they start to to um, have a different uh, look on that and and want a better life for their for their child. Uh, mental health. So um, yeah, so there could be some mental health uh, concerns as well, like anxiety, maybe from different traumas. There's uh, you know you have um, all the Different things that have happened and and that has has affected some like the lady that I'm working with. I just want to share this that um, she has she has an anxiety, so she has a real she had a really hard time coming coming out um, to programming in that. But I just you know kept um, trying to reach out to her and and when she came to program, making her feel welcome. So then I was able to. Um, connect with her and the more you develop a relationship with them then the more they feel comfortable and it could be even just you know uh, picking them up 
taking them for coffee or giving them a ride somewhere, like those that, those things make a big difference. So, um, so yeah, so it could be a lot of anxiety, mental health um, concerns. So then also impacted by suicide, I mentioned that already. So yeah, and then there's um, so there's higher levels of isolation, right? And then there's more poverty and lack of employment, and I talked about the literacy um, and the safety concerns, right, in the community that uh, a lot of times there's, uh, because in First Nation communities, because there's um, lack of housing, you have a lot of families living in, in one house, so there's a lot of times there's, there's no privacy, so, you know, you know and there's, um, um, and then in the city, you know, if they move to the city, there's um, a culture shock, right, so they're not, maybe not prepared to come in for education and, you know, they might get involved with, um, with oh no, uh oh, I'm not sure what happened here. I think can you hear me? Keep going, keep going, yep, I can hear you, yeah, keep going. I don't know, something happened at my end here, I don't know. Okay, you can keep going, if you can hear me, keep going, oh, we can hear you. Okay, I don't know what happened. Just keep going. And not. I can't even see my screen. <laughs> Sorry, I, I got a it? got a backup here. I got a backup here. Okay, and uh, um, I can move the slides for you. So if you can hear me. Okay, so I'm at risk factors. Okay, so yeah, so okay. Where am I here? Impacted by suicide. So we can all hear you at least. So just keep going and. Uh, let me know when okay. to move the slides. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what happened. Um, just got to find my spot here. Yeah. Okay, yeah. And so also, too, like because of the impacted a, a by suicide, you have um, the, the loss of identity. So say, so there's a lot of um, um, communities maybe that have um, women that, that have... Um, uh, maybe there's different faiths that they have, and so maybe they've gotten away from 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 their culture, their heritage. So uh, I know some uh, um, in some situations there there's that um, loss of identity. So not not being able to um, uh, yeah, like a sense of belonging and stuff. So there's there's that too, and then of course the um, uh, when they. Uh, I know in the communities that I had mentioned that, yeah, about the suicide. So the, and the conflict with the law. So that, so the women, maybe they've had some bad experiences with, with the law. I know in Thunder Bay there's uh, a lot of, uh, uh, you probably heard a lot on the news there about, about um, Thunder Bay and, and uh, how the police have been investigated for, for their um, interactions with First Nations people and, and stuff, so so a lot of times, uh, you know, they 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 may be targeted um, too. Like like you know, they may be walking on the street and the you know the police want to pull you over, and then you know something happens and then you're in jail. So or it could be again, you know, maybe a, a woman is stealing because she doesn't have enough food. You know, and, or she needs something, or maybe she has an addiction she's she's um, supporting. So there's there's all those things to consider too. Um, just want to see here. Um, I just want to check in, Sheila. Can you actually hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Okay. Okay. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody suggested. Okay, I'm yeah, trying to. I can get. Um, yeah. Square at the to, bottom, and maybe you you might be able. Oh, to the might bottom. be able to get us back. Maybe it's oh. at the bottom and it just got minimized. Right there. Okay. That would be great. <laughs> You're back. Okay. That's great. Thank you, Sheila. I was like, no, so what happened? <laughs> and thank you for okay. the Superior Children's Center for that one. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So I just want to go to the next slide. Oh, did I go too far? Oh, yeah. Okay, there we go. I so um, there could... A lot of times with uh, factors to consider, like they dropped out of high school, right? So they haven't finished their education, um, and um, they're, yeah, so there's that to consider. Um, involved with child welfare. So 
I think I had mentioned it um, uh, just a couple minutes ago was that um, if a woman is involved, she, as she was a child, she was involved in child welfare. So she has that experience, um, you know, and then say if she um, has a child that, that's in care as well, then, you know, that really makes things complicated. Um, and I know women, they really want to, um, they don't want to hurt their child, and but a lot of times, you know, there could be um, situations where uh, child welfare is called, right? So um, they have to investigate. So that's like this family, this one family that I'm working with, um, she has been involved with child welfare for a while, and now child welfare is back in. So, so I go with her, right? I go with her, and um, at her house we have these meetings with child welfare. So she wants to have that extra support there because her because her experience in the past with child welfare hasn't been the greatest, right? It's been negative. So, so she wanted me there as a support, just so that she had another person there. Because a lot of times. Um, you know, if, if they're by themselves and it's he said, she said kind of thing, right? So, so there's those considerations, those things to consider um, about the child welfare and it could be a lot of negative experience, right? Um, and I know just um, uh, for um, the program that I'm working with, with the Family Wellbeing Program at NAN, we are trying to partner with uh, prevention programs that um, like child welfare to to work with the with the family and keep them together because I, I know Tikanagan has a, a prevention program that they um, um, prevention program but it's not in all of First Nation communities but I know they are trying to hire so so there's that to consider right her experience in um, child welfare so um, also um, on a Employed, right? They might not have a job, and it doesn't like if you if you don't have an education, and you you know say once uh, a woman has uh, a child, and then they want you to go back to work, and it's like well it doesn't really pay right to go back to work if you have to pay for childcare, and 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 then you have to hold transportation if you don't have transportation. So there's all these things to consider as well, right? So she might lack that um, uh, employment skills as well. So. Um, and peer pressure, right? So if there's peer pressure with her um, her friends, right? Like so, she becomes pregnant. And she's um, and she's pregnant right now, and but her past, you know, all her friends are are using, and so you have to consider that. And I know there was this program that I did run when I worked at Mishkiki there. Um, it was a women's job-in program where women could come. And um, just, you know, we could talk about, you know, self-care, um, coping strategies, triggers, and all that stuff that um, help, help women get through those times when they were pressured maybe to use. Um, and, and, you know, so, yeah. So different programs like that and that are culturally appropriate as well um, do, do help and do make a difference. So, and limited social support networks, so we need to consider that. Um, what I had mentioned already. Um, so yeah, so like those lack of family support and lack of, um, uh, you know, maybe they, they're they're all they're here in town by themselves, like in, in an urban setting, and they uh, they they don't um, have any family around and and or family that's well, right? So that can really support them. They could maybe have some those negative influences. <laughs> So um, neighborhoods they live in. So that's another. I know here in Thunder Bay, there's certain areas that um, that are not really safe for for families to live, or they don't want to live there because of the high crime and the high, um, um, you know, with the use of drugs and alcohol, all that. But it, they're not really safe. So and that that that's hard too because if a lot of times those are the Places that are um, available, and and then you have um, um, uh, what do you call those uh, people who rent out houses and that who don't want to rent to First Nations people. So, like, so there's those things to consider. But the neighborhoods they live in, a lot of times they're not safe. So you need to consider that as well. 
uh, in the sex trade. Maybe maybe they're involved in the sex trade, and not um, it could be something that is encouraged maybe by their partner or something that they've done to to get money. So um, maybe they think, well, that's you know all that they 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 know how to do. So you need to yeah consider that. Um, limited parenting skills. So that is um, um, because of the residential schools and, and uh, being taken away from their families and that um, there was that break in, in parenting skills, right? And so that's passed on from generation to generation. And, um, and then a the loss of identity, right? Loss of culture, the language identity, um, all those things are, have been impacted. Um, and the land, right? Like connecting to the land that disconnect. So um, I know in a lot of um, communities um, in in northern Ontario, like this in Nam, a lot are are um, I know in the central area of, of the Nam territory, a lot of communities are having both, like doing um, like uh, uh, Christian and uh, land based, so culture. So, and then I know on the west it's more Christian, west side of the province of Ontario. And then um, I know the eastern, like the Mishkegwak, Wabin area, I know they're really, like, they're a lot of land, land, cultural, uh, traditional, and spiritual as well. So, like, the um, Christian. So, yeah, so you got to consider that. Um, a loss of identity, like I had mentioned, like, not as many people wanting to um, to go... Uh, I mean, sorry, <laughs> um, losing their culture, right, and their language, and, and bringing that back. But that is coming. That is coming back, and um, and I know there's more programming out there now that support that. So, like, there's um, well, I know Anishinaabe Mishkiki offers some programming. They have a cultural uh, program there, and then same with Friendship Centers, um, you know, Ontario Native Women's Associations, all those, yeah, um, Indigenous. Um, organizations um, have uh, access to programming as well. So inadequate access to proper nutrition. So we need to consider that as well. Like, so if she doesn't have enough money, like, you know, she's not going to have enough, um, you know, money to, to feed properly, right? So a lot of times she'll, you know, make sure her child, you know, has enough, but, you know, she'll go with it out. And so that's why when you do have programming, I, I mentioned that in the slides too, that uh, that are coming up. That food, having uh, food at your programming, if you um, are doing programming, um, that food is is a really um, key thing to to bring families in, and having a yeah having a meal and even having food extra on hand. And so we also need to consider past experiences. So past experiences like. She maybe has a lot of negative past experiences with, with, um, um, you know, with the healthcare system, with uh, hospitals, with uh, the law, um, going to programming, you know, in other places. So you need to consider that. And if she's had a negative experience, experience uh, going somewhere, she, um, you know, most likely they'll they'll tell you. And a lot of racism, right? So a lot of our families. Uh, face racism on a, on a daily basis, and, and then the isolation I had mentioned, like especially um, um, if she's not in a good um, situation where, family situation where the partner is really controlling, she might not be able to go out much, so, um, so you need to consider that. And then isolation as well in the northern communities where there's, lot, there's not as many um, uh, services up there as well, so you have to try to, you know, be uh, resourceful and creative and work with other programs to to help um, help with that. So understanding the needs of Indigenous women, so being aware of the Indigenous history is is really really um, is a first step. And I know um, Tanya Talaga um, has a book, and I have it at the end of the the uh, slides there on resources as a good read. So um, it's called, um, well, she has uh, Finding uh, the Pathway Forward. So that's that's one. 
that she's talked about, um, about the suicides and stuff, but also the seven fathers, fall and feathers um, that talk about racism, death, and, and, um, and about the youth that have died in Thunder Bay, the seven youth. Um, so yeah, so just learning about the history, even like reaching out to other uh, Aboriginal, you know, going to community events, um, talking to other Indigenous partners, that um, inviting, you know, um, someone from an Indigenous organization to come and share about, um, uh, maybe to your staff about that, you you know, you, there's, there's that. Um, and then reading up on books and, and stuff. So first impressions make the, the difference. So when, when they first arrive, you know, showing a real interest, welcoming them, welcoming them and um, and really, you know, paying attention to them, and you know, and uh, you know, introducing yourself with them, and and uh, yeah, so all those things make a real difference, and accept them for who they are. You know, sometimes they you know might not have you know the clean clothes, or you know, or um, you know, maybe maybe they're um, yeah, like maybe they had to walk to your program, so and you know you got to consider that. But anyways, accept them for who they are. Meaning, you know, like don't place, place judgments on people until you till you get to know them. Um, yeah, talk to them. You know, visit with them. You know, and um, you know, visit other Aboriginal organizations. Um, indigenous understanding the needs of Indigenous women. So what can we do? So obviously, learn about cultural teachings and practices. So uh, it, and it varies, right, from, from community to community. So really knowing um, where your women are coming from or the area that, that you live in, that you can ask um, some elders or uh, elders or resource people in the community. And if the Indigenous uh, centers, like the Indigenous Friendship Centers or ONWAs, they usually will have, or health centers, they usually will have a list of people that you can look um to, right, to, to bring in and, and um, or even talk to, right, go visit them. Um, attend community events in, attend events in your community. So, um, so if there's, maybe there's power, maybe there's um, uh, like different things that are happening that, you know, you can attend and being visible in the community that, that really, um, yeah, makes a, makes a difference too because they see you outside of, of um, you know, your, where you work. So that makes makes a difference. Um, uh, connect with Indigenous agencies. I said um, invite them to do presentations or partnering with them. So maybe they have a program that you want to bring to your agency, um, or vice versa. Maybe it's you wanting to go to another agency and, and share your knowledge with this um, with another um, organization or agency, and invite elders and people to your elders and resource people to your program. So there could be a lot of people that um, are, you know, there's a lot of people that are skilled in beading and making, um, you know, the, the baby bundles, uh, the moss bags, or, um, you know, different things. Um, I have some ideas that I have done in the past. I'll share that at the, at the end. Um, yeah, maybe there's committees, too, like committees that you can, um, Go on, like I know in Thunder Bay they have that, like say there's the um, domestic, Aboriginal Domestic Violence Committee. So if you're working with Indigenous women, uh, you know, that's a table where you can sit at and, you know, whether it's parenting or whether it's, um, yeah, different things like that. Um, so educate yourself where they come from, I had mentioned that. Um, yeah, so trauma-informed approach is, is just, you know, a really good uh, way of, um, understanding where women are coming from about these traumas that they've experienced um, from, you know, like with domestic violence, with abuse, um, you know, the, the um, affected by suicide, like all these different things that, that women have experienced. Um, it, it's a way to get to understand where they're coming from and, um, yeah, and it's like a strength base. You know, it's a, a trauma informed is working with the women's um, strengths, right? And looking, understanding trauma, and also empowering them, right? Um, is that empower empowerment piece? Um, and then again, develop 
building that trust, and it's client oriented. So you really got to um, um, develop that relationship. Um, yeah. So then assumptions, like I, I know sometimes we just got to be aware. Like right away, we say if a woman doesn't come to your program, and you know right away you assume, oh well, if she doesn't want to come or she's lazy or whatever. That it, that's not the case. It could be, you know, may, maybe she was up really late. Um, maybe she has another child that she's up with, and and um, you know she slept slept in, and or she doesn't have transportation, or you know maybe something came up. Like, so we just got to be aware of our assumptions, but not to assume um, anything, you know, until you you know reach out and um, connect with them. And of course, to attend trainings and workshops and seminars. There's there's lots of great ones out there that talk, you know, about informed trauma, you know, women centered care. Um, I know there's that smart training. I, I put it as a resource at the end too. That's a really good training. Um, the Margaret Leslie uh, Mothercraft. Um, that that's a really good great one. Um, Get involved in communities, yeah, and coalitions involving families. So I had mentioned that already. So um, harm reduction approaches. So harm reduction approaches is, um, you know, reducing the amount of harm to to baby and mom. So like if a me, uh, sorry, if a mom is, um, you know, maybe she's on methadone now, now that she's pregnant. Say she was using. And, um, and now she's smoking, right? So you're like, oh, I wish she would quit smoking. But the thing is, is that like um, some women need some sort of coping strategies, right? So like, so, um, so we need to be aware that, you know, you're trying to reduce as much harm to the baby. I'm not condoning smoking at all, but I'm just saying is that, um, you know, if she has past traumas and um, things that have happened to her in the past, you know, she she's going to um, do something, right? That that um, helps support her. And I know a lot of women too, um, if, especially if they're in pain. Like if they have, say, they've been in an accident, and and um, you know, they they um, maybe they use marijuana for pain. That I know the one lady that I'm working with, um, she she does use it because she's been, um, you know, a couple of car accidents and. And she and she uses that to help her, right, with her situation. So, but so we just need to realize, like, the harm reduction approach. Like, I know you're wanting to reduce as much harm as you can to the baby, and so we just want you to um, um, be care, uh, be supportive. Um, abstinence is not a requirement to attend a programs. I know, like, for us, it, it doesn't like, and I know people slip up and and have. Um, you know, slip ups, right? So that they um, they're really trying, and and um, and then they end up going um, slipping up. But you know, it's not it's not a place I think to judge. It's just to support her where she's at. Try to be understanding and uh, and try to ha reach out to her and help her, right? With um, um, with what's going on, because because uh, you know, working with First Nations people, like it's. Uh, Issues are very complex, very complex. So building that relationship with her, right? And it takes time. So when you when you develop that relationship with um, with this with women, um, you know they'll become more f comfortable with you and be able to share more. And um, so it's nice to have a um, um, nice area, like you know whether it's you know like a couch, like a area, a couple of couches, you know, you know table. Um, a little area for the children to play. Uh, um, I know sometimes some um, places have a separate child um, area, and so a lot of times too, of course, the children when if uh, the the women have um, other children uh, that come to your program while she's pregnant, um, they could be very clingy and not want to leave the mom. But it, that's again, you know, de de developing that relationship with. The family takes time, and you'll be able to, um, um, and then eventually the the child will be able to play on their own. I, I know I've had many experiences like that, <laughs> and listen to her story. So listen to her story, um, what she's saying, 
um, yeah, try not to be too shocked about some of the things that she's saying because I know um, a lot of times women, they, they have so much, so much that they're carrying with them and um, so being ha able to reach out to somebody to, you know, that, that will listen to them and that, that really helps a lot. Get to know her and her family, invite her partner. You know, um, I know with the programs at Mishkiki there, we used to invite the whole family, like bring the whole family and we, you know, feed everybody and it'd be informal, formal setting and uh, yeah, so, and then safety plans. So if you have, so if they're in a situation where they, um, they could be harmed or, um, or for themselves if they think they're going to, you know, maybe it's a woman that thinks they might be using, then you want to come up with some safety plans. Once you see, you know, get to know her more, that um, uh, where she can, uh, what she can do in certain situations, whether she's, you know, in a domestic violence situation or just from using, um, you know, preventing her from using again. So you, there's that. Um, also, referrals and internal and external. So referrals meaning, so if you're working at a health center or um, a organization where you have more than um, than one programming, so if you have mental health counseling within your program, that that's the best in one place because then, um, of course, with the woman's um, permission, then you can can refer them right to to different programs internally, whether it's counseling, um, you know, nutrition, um, cooking programs, that kind of thing. And also externally could be, um, you know, maybe there's a Healthy Babies program or um, or maybe this, um, like, um, maybe there's a different program at Ontario Native Women's or there's maybe a Métis Nation program or, or the Friendship Center might have a program. So having those connections with those other other agencies um, and knowing what's going on really, really helps. Um, doing home visits, that is uh, another thing too that's very helpful for women um, that who may don't have, uh, might not have transportation. So being able to go in the home and, and she might need help with her house, right? She might need help with cleaning her house and um, you know, doing dishes, cooking meals, that sort of thing. So um, if you can do home visits, if, if they agree to it, but it might not happen right away, but it, it might. Um, again, you know, there's um, sometimes there's uh, uh, with home visits, there might be um, a threat or that they, you know, uh, oh, it's, you know, maybe they're going to call uh, child welfare. So that might be a concern too to think about that um, that they might not want you in the home because they're worried that you're you know you, once you see their home you're going to call child welfare. But try not to um, uh, you know just to be supportive and and help her where she's at uh, because you know maybe maybe she needs help with that. Same with food security. You might not have enough food, so we need to provide um, you know extra food for them or you know give out food vouchers at programs. Stuff and provide food like a meal when they come, so that's a really good one. Or like uh, food banks and stuff, and being able to deliver it. Like this is something I want to mention. Like if you can deliver it to the house, that's even better. Um, I know a lot of times some of these programs they they offer food programs and stuff, but they but you know you have, the woman has to get there and then has to be able to take it home. And if she's got lots of bags, she's going on the bus, and if it's winter. Like, you know, that, that's just this barrier, eh? Okay? So, and policies. So we need to look at policies um, within our organization as to um, is it really, is it helping our people? Um, like uh, in women, is it for women or is it not? So we really need to look at those, um, those policies and, and to, if they are uh, supportive. And if, Oh, expect an inch, not a mile. So little, you know, little bits of um, um, growth, you know, and um, it's, yeah, so I'm going to leave it at that. Advocacy and outreach. So advocating, they might ask you to advocate for them. So maybe um, 
um, writing letters for them, support letters. They might want to ask you for a support letter that they've attended your program, or maybe they want you to sit in on a meeting that they have. Maybe maybe it is with child welfare or um, you know that sort of thing. So we just got to consider all those. Um, advocacy and outreach and, and trying to support them um, and, and what they need. Maybe it's housing. Maybe they need help filling out forms or um, that sort of thing. Um, okay, so harm reduction, yeah, that's uh, the methadone and buprenorphine. You, you I have a hard time with that word. <laughs> so that those are two uh, opioid uh, harm reductions. I'm not going to get into that, but I know um, What's my name? Oops. Sorry, just give me one sec. Yeah, Alice, Alice or Dean has a lot of great information on that, so I'm not going to really get into that. Um, trauma-informed approach. So understanding what trauma is and um, is uh, is a first first step. Um, harm harm reduction approaches, which I had mentioned. Um, reducing harm to the baby. Oh, creating safe spaces that is comforting and welcoming. So this is something that um, even with the program I'm working with right now, that it's, uh, we, we, we talk about this, creating safe spaces. So safe space, um, so when she comes to your program, is it, you know, is it comforting? Is it welcoming? Is it really a place that um, welcomes her? So, you know, maybe having some of the cultural um, art or in there, um, and then you know a nice maybe a nice couch, creating safe spaces so that she can come. You know her children, maybe she's got children with her, so she can come and um, and and feel safe, right, and feel like home. So that's something we really need to consider when we're um, creating programs. Is that is this a really a warm, comforting space and safe, right? Because um, sometimes women. Again, they, they fear, right, that someone will call child welfare on, the, on them because of, you know, maybe the way their child is dressed and, and stuff. So, so we need to consider that. Um, Strength-based. So working from a strength-based approach, there's always strength in people, and that's, you know, has to do with empowerment, empowering pe women. So um, once I know the women that I'm working with, um, uh, I know one of them. I'm really there for more of like a um, like a, a social like um, support, meaning like she'll come and talk to me, like reach out to me when she's feeling down and stuff like that. And a lot of times when I when I finish talking with her, I usually let her do all the talking, <laughs> and um, and then I I don't tell her you know oh you know you know you should do this you should do that. And a lot of times she knows. Right? She, she has the answers when she starts talking. Sometimes they just need to, um, you know, uh, maybe they're complaining about their partner or something or, you know, that uh, situation that they're in. And, um, but, but, you know, you always look at their strengths, right? Because a lot of women, they, they're really smart and they know the answers. And, but there's always something that, you know, that they're, you know, maybe they have other children and they're looking after their children or, you know, that, that, that um, they have these strengths in them and maybe they're good at, at uh, doing crafts or something and having them, um, you know, show the group, you know, what they what their skills are and um, makes them feel good, right? And empowering them to really make a difference in their lives and, and wanting to, um, um, you know, get uh, prenatal care and, and be... Um, be, yeah, be in, involved in um, the health and well-being of, of her unborn child. So um, women, yeah, women have choices. So that, you know, leave it to them, right? Give it, it's, it's in their hands what they want to do. So, um, and validating, validating their, um, their concerns and um, just the, their experiences that they've been through. So... So we need to remember that. Um, remember about our biases and language and what we, uh, how we use our language, right? Because if we're using these big words, then 
it, you know, they might not understand. They might, they might not say, well, what does that word mean? Like, they might not say that and then wonder, you know, what it was after. So, um, so we just got to be careful, like, you know, grade six level. I always um, work, recommend that. And then uh, biases. So we got to be careful of our, our biases. So, you know, every woman has um, Indigenous women are already, you know, at a disadvantage, right? So we got to consider, you know, where they come from, um, their history, and and just to be aware of that. And then trauma informed is the healing. So any type of healing that they want to do, we, you know, to be supportive of that and um, and their culture, right? To be supportive of their culture, and 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 oh, not to always to um, assume. Because uh, not all um, First Nations people know their culture. Uh, maybe you know, maybe they were um, adopted and they they don't know their birth family. So it's possible that they might not even um, know their their own culture. So just to be aware of that. Um, so never assume that they don't know their culture because maybe they're more Christian and. Um, uh, so you know that that's something we need to um, talk about, uh, or you know figure out her situation and and her culture and spirituality. Uh, referrals, referring um, you know internally and externally. I mentioned home visits, outreach, yeah, agency policies, um, yeah, being non-judgmental. That's really really important, and um, having compassion and empathy. We really, really need to be um, considerate of uh, an understanding of where they've come from. And again, safe spaces, making sure that space is comfortable and warm and welcoming. Um, Trauma-informed approach, right? And location. So location meaning, um, so you want people to come to your program, but if you're not offering bus tickets and they don't have that extra money for the bus tickets, just consider that. So um, families, uh, if you can go to where they are, to neighbor, sorry, to neighborhoods where they are, that's even better. And and then having food, um, food, food, food. I always make when when I worked at Mishkiki there, I always made tons of food, and and uh, yeah. So make sure, yeah, there's always food there because that's nice. And then childcare. If you can have childcare there, working with somebody. You know, um, maybe maybe if, okay, if it's not within your organization, then maybe with another organization, you can partner with them and do childcare. Um, I mentioned transportation, so consider that giving out bus tickets is really good, or even giving having um, taxi vouchers or get, having um, a way there, right, is is helpful. Um, go to where they are living. Yeah, ask them how they want to be reached. So like when you when you say they come through your doors and, and it's nice to be able to say, oh well, you know, can I reach out to you again? Um, what's the best way to, to get call you? And a lot of times Facebook is that's it's it's that's a <laughs> big one social media, right? So but it could be phone, could be email, who knows, right? Uh, text, yeah. Uh, so so kind of asking them, right? That way to support them. Um, follow up with them, but not too aggressively. So what I mean by this is like. So you want to follow up with them, say, oh, when you talk to them, say, hey, okay, I'll follow, follow up with you next week or something, right? And um, so, you know, just um, not to, like, you know, 10 calls a day or whatever, but, like, you know, follow up with them, but, um, yeah, so not too aggressively. And then strength-based approach, of course. Um, there's always strength in everybody. And, um, and once you start talking to women, you'll be able to pull out, uh, you know what their strong points are, and um, yeah, so really consider that uh, mental health. So we need to consider, you know, mental health, you know, and and addictions, right? They go hand in hand. Um, so so consider that. Um, women experiencing, um, yeah, depression, anxiety are likely to to use non-prescription drugs, right? Like the um, marijuana and stuff, and and coping strategies. So we need to really. Um, Excuse me. Um, really teach them coping strategies and what else they can do. Um, say, um, you know, if um, they are using. So um, just to just to um, that's a really good one. 
Um, so why Indigenous women don't ask services? So a lot of times they might feel ashamed, like might feel ashamed of uh, who they are, um, how they how they're dressed, or you know just of their past experiences, and or they might feel judged. And so also families who attend mainstream programs um, have different issues than Indigenous families. So so um, yeah, so it could be you know when they um, just um, yeah, I don't know what else to add to that. It's just self-explanatory. Is yeah, so they don't have the same issues. So um, sometimes if you're doing programming with Indigenous and non-Indigenous, um, the Indigenous people will feel uncomfortable because they're just some. I don't know. They just can't relate to some of the um, uh, mainstream uh, their experience. Um, they feel like they don't belong or fit in. Uh, they could feel like that too. Um, so really considering. Um, like the location, who you have there, maybe bringing in somebody from an Indigenous organization to come in and do partner and do programming. Uh, there needs to be their needs. Uh, their needs are oh, not being met. So yeah, so if they're really you know if they're hungry and or they need housing, you know, um, or struggling with mental health, like you know those, those are things that you need to consider. Um, lack of self confidence and self esteem. So if they've been in a domestic violence situation then they might not have the self-confidence and self-esteem um, as others. And, uh, and I know in the Indigenous women, uh, most, of, most of them, most of us are, uh, are shy, right? And it's very quiet and might not speak that much as well. So, and as mentioned, domestic violence. Um, yeah, there could be addictions um, as well, mental health, and fear their child will be apprehended. Um, and both safe space is it safe? So um, they might have lack of parenting and um, being in a routine. I know I'm working with this with this one family I'm working with, or mom, trying to get her back on track um, with some routines, right? And um, being able to parent and um, and past experiences, right? A lot of times past experiences um, influence their, um, who, who they are and how they behave today. So, and there's trauma, transportation, they might not have transportation, as I mentioned, they might not have childcare, so why, you know, where would they go? Um, so those are things to consider why they don't access and location of the program. Um, the lack of service is not relevant to what they're wanting, but if you can partner, yeah, like if you're in a health health unit or um, maybe you can partner with another organization and maybe do try to do programming there. Um, and lack of cultural programming maybe, yeah, that could be another one. And try not to push your own agenda on them because they might not, um, uh, you know, might not want to do what you want, <laughs> right? So, um, okay. So, um, engaging prenatal women is uh, pregnancies of right, time when women look at their life and they really want to make uh, some lifestyle changes for their unborn child. So, and those brief interventions really make a big difference. So, um, so anytime, you know, I, I know when I when I was doing prenatal education um, at Mashkiki there, um, a lot of times, you know, uh, you know, we would come in, we would have something to eat, and and then we would, you know, have these um, little bits of information. And I know some women, you know, would be kind of in and out because they'd have to leave and stuff like that. But anytime that they're coming to your program, at least if they're coming there, that's that's the first huge step. And little brief interventions is is um, is is uh, really important, and she'll 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 get it. You know, all those brief interventions really make a big difference on, you know, whether it's um, yeah, talking about like um, drinking during pregnancy, like that kind of thing. Little things here and there really um, do make a difference, and. Prenatal women, they do, they do not intentionally want to hurt their unborn child. They, they could be dealing with a lot of traumas, and, and that's their only way of coping. Um, so, um, so engaging and empowering, and, sorry, empowering Indigenous women. Uh, so be welcoming and non-judgmental. Do, um, yeah, do you have any preconceptions or biases? Um, sit and eat with the women and their family. Get to know them. Be, be mindful of your body language, your tone of voice, your facial expressions, your 
your language and that you use, and obviously compassion and empathy. Uh, be patient. So when she shares her story, try not to be alarmed um, if she's gone through a lot of traumas. Just you know, try to um, just to be supportive and try to if she asks you know for for help or what what should I do or what can I do then you know then you can you know suggest and um, and stuff like that for sure um, but you can you can offer suggestions on you know we have this program here or we got this here um, you know you you can all I have to do is do a referral so um, and again giving her the choice right um, most of the time she will know how to solve her own problems when she starts um, feeling comfortable and, and talking um, and that's where the counseling if you can if you can get her, um, once you get to know her and if she wants counseling, then, um, you know, for sure, then, then she'll uh, have some, um, someone to talk to um, who can help her with those issues. So praise and give encouragement for any accomplishments. So if she's, um, you know, coming to programming, that's reaching out to you, that's awesome. And, um, you know, that, that, that's something that you... Um, just to give her encouragement for that. Praise her on her strengths and from strength-based approach, active listening. Um, so after offering child care, that, uh, yeah, I just wanted to mention that is, um, is really important. Um, transportation, kind of repeating here. Oh, provide meals and snacks and have health, healthy food on hand for her to take home. So it could be milk, bread, eggs, that kind of thing. Um, invite her partner to come, have informal setting, um, connect with her, see her as a mother, daughter, sister, friend, and neighbor. You know, we, she's, she's someone's mother, right? She's someone's daughter. Um, remember, every person was once a child. Um, humor, humor is always good. We always laugh about different things. I remember we always used to talk and laugh and have lots of fun. And then if you, um, she's agreed to referrals, then you can refer her within your agency or, or another. Advocacy, if she asks you for support, maybe, um, hope, you know, I, I think this is a, um, advocacy is a big part if um, she's needing help with filling out forms for housing um, or even for social assistance or um, those sorts of things, like she might need advocacy or even with child welfare. Um, so just to advocate for her and help her uh, be at meetings for her um, and have extra supplies on hand. Um, first impressions are crucial, never assume. That's why I had mentioned before about you know, never assume she, uh, the woman knows her culture because she might not. Uh, um, continual support. like. Like, don't give up on her. You know, it might be challenging when you're working with Indigenous women, but it, it's, it's really, um, it takes time and offer that continual support so that, um, yeah, so that uh, don't give up on her. She, she might, uh, you know, break away for a little bit, but she will come back or try to reach out to her again. Um, just, yeah, keep reaching out. Um, referrals, advocacy, yeah. So wrap around, ask them what they need in terms of support. So meet them where they're at, you know, their stages of change. Maybe she's not, uh, if she's using, maybe she's not ready, but you're trying to engage with her to, to, um, to make some change. Um, but be supportive on where she's at and motivational interviewing. Um, advocacy, uh, circle of care, this is an example of a program used um, to identify clients at risk. So um, like a home, home visiting program, by, um, wraparound strategies, coping strategies, so, you know, giving her those coping strategies to deal with um, um, situations that she's in, harm reduction, outreach, collaboration with other organizations, cultural teachings and programming. Uh, programming ideas, so I just wanted to touch on this, uh, some things that we've done is belly button pouch making, those are, um, yeah, so we had some people come in, um, or maybe it was our cultural person within our, our agency, come in and uh, make little bell, bell, sorry, belly button pouches to put the baby's belly button in. Um, and um, so that's always nice. Baby blankets, I know that um, depends on if you're doing the squares, that can take a long time. It might take you know quite a few sessions, but um, or you can do those tie blankets. 
you know, making something that they can take away and any skills that they can learn is awesome. Um, baby bundle or moss bag making. Um, maybe there's people within your community that um, that know how to make this, and um, you know you have to have all the supplies. And maybe you can reach out to uh, Indigenous organization to, um, or maybe you know somebody within your organization that um, can do that. Um, moccasin making. Those are really cu yeah cute once they learn how to make it, and it could take you know more than one session depending on. Um, um, yeah, depending on how fast they are. And wraps, uh, baby wraps, like to wrap the baby in, and um, and maybe bring in somebody to do cultural teaching. Um, ask, yeah, I already said that. Um, craft, maybe do different crafts and cooking, preparing food. And when, I just want to mention when you're preparing food, it's not try not to um, get too fancy, like uh, because if um, Indigenous women you're working with, if they're on a um, limited budget, like they're not going to, they're not going to really cook with all these fancy spices or different foods that that's unfamiliar with them. Like, kind of do basic stuff. But food preparation, that's a really good way to come together and um, cook food and you know, and to laugh and talk and and have some fun. And uh, try to do fun interactive games to learn about pregnancy, childbirth, and newborn care. I know I incorporated this into my programming, and, and it was a lot of fun because you, you know, whether it was a board game or something or um, nutrition bingo, that kind of thing. And um, and then talking about self-care is um, another good one, too, and taking care of yourself. And, yeah, it could be maybe just making um, bath, you know, uh, soap or something or um um, by community members to share their knowledge and skills, like uh, yeah, like elders and knowledge keepers and stuff. Um, Best Start has a lot of resources that are very helpful and videos. Um, uh, and handouts need to be at a grade six level. Um, yeah, so there's a picture there of um, making the um, the moss bag, the baby bundle there with the birch. So that's uh, and prevention strategies. Teach yourself, um, cultural approaches, and focus on strength. Um, other ways to reach women, maybe you do displays. Maybe you do a display in the mall or, or put an uh, article in the paper or do a poster and hand it out to you know, other um, organizations and put, put posters up, do workshops, um, you know, ads on the radio, TV, websites, monthly calendars. Um, and then connecting with their community, become so familiar with local culture, talk to elders, you know, key decision makers, get to know their children, the women and fathers, especially having big community events is really nice. Like, um, I'm just going to talk about, yeah, like when I worked at Mashkiki, we would do, every year we did this Father's Day um, picnic, and uh, we partnered with all these other um, indigenous organizations and non-indigenous, and came together and invited everybody to, you know, to the marina and different things like that. It's really coming together and getting to know people and families and stuff, and it's really great. Um, um, okay. Oh, yeah. And so here are the additional resources the Seven Fallen Southers was telling about and all our relations. And this video, this was we did at Mashkiki there when um, before I left. The way of the past um, is the way of the future. So having those uh, indigenous resources available as well. Um, this is an awesome video. I, I can't say enough about it. It's just about women speaking about their experiences with breastfeeding and um, and some of their challenges in that. And, and it's, it's awesome. And then Indian Horse, the young boys' uh, experience of regi residential school. And um, the health unit. Um, that's the uh, where you can't see. <laughs> and then Christopher, Dr. Christopher Musquash. He's yeah, Canadian Research Chair in Indigenous Mental Health and Addictions. So he's got a lot of. Um, if you go on his uh, website, he's got a lot of resources that you can. Um, or different papers he's read uh, done. So you, you can have to request uh, papers, but. And this, uh, yeah, this uh, the prenatal. Um, the beginning journey there, that the that was a really good book. I just want to mention that these both these the breastfeeding and the um, the beginning journey. I always had extra copies on hand when women would come to programming because uh, 
um, I, I would give them one to take home, like if this is the topic we were talking about, and um, then um, I would always have copies at, at the place where I was doing programming because a lot of times they're not going to bring their copy back, right? So always having those extra co copies on hand is, uh, is really good. And, and that's, yeah, they're both really awesome resources that I used a lot that, um, that you can just, you know, use the, that book and, um, and do different topics um, during pregnancy. And Cindy Blackstock has a lot of great resources as well, the Caring Society. Um, and she's got a lot of YouTube stuff too. Um, go on YouTube, she's, she's awesome. I can't say enough about her. I just want to say one thing about Cindy Blackstock though, <laughs> is that um, she took the federal government to court, um, uh, the Human Rights Tribunal there, and because Indigenous um, uh, uh, First Nations uh, children um, were not, um, didn't have as much, as much program and resources as mainstream child welfare. So, so now, um, now there's more um, money uh, that First Nations can access on prevention and supporting families. So, so yeah, so Cindy Blastock, they won, and now the federal government has to um, uh, compensate the First uh, Nations communities um, for the lack of funding that they've that they haven't received in over the years. And Mothercraft, yeah, that's that uh, smart training. That was awesome. Um, and the other prenatal education key messages, yeah, those are good ones too. Uh, used a lot of the prenatal education models modules during my um, uh, programming. They're just, you know, they're nice and plain and simple and um, to the point. So those are great resources from Best Start. And that's it. I'm really comfortable with it. <laughs> <laughs> I see, Larry, I'm back on. Yeah, I know you had to speed up a little bit at the end. I, first, Sorry. I really want to thank you, and I want to thank the participants. I know we we do have questions. Like we may, people may have questions. I I want to make sure the participants that don't have the opportunity to stay for questions, that's fine. They might have something else lined up at three o'clock. But this was very interesting, and it got more and more interesting as we went on. And I wanted more and more as we went on. Uh, so anyway, uh, feel free if you have questions, please type them in the chat box. As you exit the presentation, you should be brought to a link where you can fill out an evaluation, and we will do a three-month follow-up. And in about an hour, I'm going to send you all a link to the presentation and to the evaluation also. So I really want to thank you for uh, being so uh, yeah, so energetic and so enthusiastic. You, I can see that you're passionate about what you what you talk about. So if anybody has questions, they can type them into the box. And if you want to download any files, if you haven't had a chance to do it or check some of the web links, this is a good time to do it too. And uh, type in any questions. So I think, yeah, some people say no questions. Great presentation. That's great. Um, so we'll give, uh, we'll, I see some people are typing, so we'll give them a minute to, to type their question. And uh, yeah, there will be one more webinar next week, uh, but the reg registration is full and it's on engaging prenatal women that might be from other vulnerable sectors uh, of society. And what I did notice too, like engagement of women, whether they're First Nations or otherwise vulnerable, you know, all the, the principles would stay the same and it was very uh, applicable. Some of the activities would be likely different, but I thought that was kind of interesting because it would apply to people who are refugees or, you know, have just arrived to, to Canada, newcomers that don't have maybe some social connection or have different cultural background. And a lot of a lot of what you said was very applicable to women, you know, how to respect and treat them and understand their needs and try to help them meet their needs. So here's a question. Um, oh, okay, no, <laughs> there, okay. If, yeah, if you did not register for next week, you could try to send us an email. Hopefully we won't, like, there's sometimes one or two people that cancel at the last minute, so leave, leave that spot open on your schedule and we will try to fit, the, fit you in. Send me an email after and uh, we'll, we'll see if uh, we can fit you in. So I don't think there are any more questions.
So that's great. Thank you very much, Sheila. And uh, yeah, if anybody has questions after, you can send them to me and I'll pour them to, to Sheila if you don't mind. And uh, because it was all very useful information. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll be in touch. I will close the meeting now and then we will, uh, all, you should all get the, the evaluation link automatically if the magic works. Oh, what's the email? Okay, I'll type my email address right in there now. Uh, help. So Lou, Lou L. Shaket at Health Nexus, better get that right, .ca, if you need to uh, to contact me for some, some reason. But the email I sent yesterday would have had my email address on it too. Okay, great. Take care. Okay, great. Oh, sorry. Okay. We're good. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, thank you. Bye.